Welcome everybody and thank you for coming out on this uh, 660th hot day in a row in Melbourne. Um, I'm Melissa Caston from the Caston Centre for Human Rights Law at Monash University. And before we go to start proceedings, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I'd also like to inform you that um, the Caston Centre will be tweeting this event. So if you're following on your phone or device, uh, follow along to the hashtag CCRITA. The uh, name is posted up around the walls. You've now made, David the uh, illustrious uh, goal of being your own hashtag. Um, and as you know, this is actually quite an important achievement. Um, I don't know that David needs a lot of introduction to us. I know that um, you've seen his bio in the materials that have been sent out earlier. But David is a graduate of the University of Western Australia and the London School of Economics. He's now the Chief Executive Officer of, Peace, of Greenpeace Australia Pacific. Um, I've known him since way before then, in the days when David was in, involved in um, native title law and we probably met at one of those enormously endurance <laughs> native title conference uh, events. Um, and uh, David's books include um, Contesting Native Title and The Native Title Market. Uh, you might see his writings regularly now um, in various op-eds uh, that um, both on... Um, mainstream media and new media. Um, and he is also a columnist for the London Journal Global Policy. So David's recently returned to Australia to take up his current role with Greenpeace um, after some time working with Greenpeace in London. Um, and I, I like to... I, I, I wanted David to subtitle this, this talk, Honey, I Broke the Environment. Um, but um, we are very interested to hear about um, David's views on how law can um, work to protect the environment or to the extent that law can do that. Um, and I particularly am interested because um, my, from my point of view, I tend to see hurdles, David tends to see opportunities, so I'm very interested to see the opportunities he thinks that law might present to us. Um, so if you'll join me in welcoming David, thank you. I'm going to start by reminding you, Melissa, that the first time I met you, I asked for your autograph. Um, of course. Because it was a day, and I've just disconnected the... I just need to find some way of putting my, my talk down without actually ending life as we know it, which would be a pretty bad start for the head of Greenpeace in Australia. <laughs> Not many people can do what you've just done. For those watching online, I understand this is the electric viewing right now. Can we can we shift it a little? Otherwise, I'm going to lose everything off the ground. This is dearly the sort of thing we would have said that. Yeah, yes. Right. Um, so I do want to start by thanking the Caston Centre for inviting me to speak here this evening. Um, and I also want to thank Melissa personally. Uh, Melissa warned me about saying anything about her this evening because she gets to talk last, but um, I'm going to demonstrate some bravery and do it. Um, some of you will know the, already the extent to which Melissa's energy and determination are the X factor behind a whole lot of good things that happen in Australia and that um, are never identified as being the work of Melissa Caston. Um, so I do actually want to just take a moment to acknowledge that Melissa is a persistent and determined fighter for a more compassionate and more decent Australia, and I thank her for that. Uh, as I say, I've been fortunate enough to be a guest of the Caston Centre before, and it is always an enormous honour to be a guest of Caston. Um, I want to start what I'm going to say this evening um, by talking a little bit about the uh, external world, the environment and its... Uh, the drivers of environmental destruction and the, the limits of, of our world. Um, according to one influential scientific paper published in 2009, uh, the Earth has nine planetary boundaries, and those nine planetary boundaries define the safe 
operating space for humanity. Sadly, according to the scientific team that undertook the survey, three of these, the climate, uh, biodiversity loss and the nitrogen cycle, have already been exceeded and we need to pull back. Others are under threat. Now this evening I'm going to talk principally about climate change because it's the most urgent of the environmental crises. Now there are regular big reports that come out from august international institutions about just how serious climate change is. I'm going to refer briefly to the most recent, which is the World, the World Bank's turn down the heat. You can just imagine the internal communications department trying to work out what to call the report. Uh, turn down the heat, why a four degree uh, warmer world must be avoided that was published in November last year. Now the current president of the bank wrote in his forward the following words. This report spells out what the world would be like if it is warmed by 4 degrees Celsius, which is what scientists are nearly unanimously predicting by the end of the century, without serious policy changes. The 4 degree scenarios are devastating. The inundation of coastal cities, increasing risks for food production, potentially leading to higher malnutrition rates. Many dry regions becoming drier, wet regions becoming wetter, unprecedented heat waves in many regions, especially in the tropics, substantially exacerbated water scarcity in many regions, increased frequency of high intensity tropical cyclones, irreversible loss of biodiversity, including coral reef systems. And then he added, and most importantly, a four degree world is so different from the current one that it comes with high uncertainty and new risks that threaten our ability to anticipate and plan for future adaptation needs. Now, the World Bank, of course, I don't need to say, is hardly a vendor of the Green Left Weekly or um, your local purveyor of, of rumours and conspiracies. It is a highly conservative institution, and this is the president of the World Bank writing in these very serious terms. Since that report, though, the data has only got worse. In late November last year, another report was presented to the UN, um, this time a, a, small, a, a, a single study indicating that large-scale thawing of permafrost may already have started, causing leakage of methane that is currently trapped underground. Now that news takes us, uh, to quote the brave Fairfax front page, to the edge of catastrophe. Um, then last week it was reported that 2012 saw the second greatest annual rise in CO2 emissions on record. One can put this in so many ways. Of course, being an Australian male, I tend to think of these things in sporting parlance. And so if we think about avoiding two degrees uh, as a cricket run chase in a one-day match, it is true that we can still make the target, but the run rate is already steep and is increasing ball by ball, over by over. So the question I have for this audience and the question I want to pose this evening is this. What is the law going to do about it? Or well, to put it another way, as a matter of law, does the end of the world as we know it feel fine? Now, as every student of the legal history of the environment knows, historically the common law has offered little in the way of for protecting the natural world. We inherited a system of law and institutions that are inadequate for restraining the massive and systemic harms that can be done to the environment in the course of complex industrial society. And so it was in the face of that heritage, really, that modern environmental law comes into being, is, is legislated into existence, um, and emerges as a key component of what has been described as the compromise of liberal environmentalism. Unfortunately, though, as we look back on 10 or 20 years of, of that kind of legislative uh, incremental advance, what we have seen is that environmental law, has, as it has developed in this country, although the same, I have to say, applies elsewhere around the world, has done very little to restrain the drivers of global warming. Indeed, the limitations of the law and its courts to deal with climate change have been evident from the very beginning. The first case in Australia that was taken to prevent the construction of a coal-fired power station on the grounds of its contribution to global warming, a case that was, is now some 18 years old, and that was brought by Greenpeace, um, uh, concerned the Red Bank power station in the Hunter Valley, 
Now, Greenpeace lost that case, and the nature of our loss has been repeated many times in Australia since. In that matter, Justice Perlman concluded that there was nothing in the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, or any other instrument that was raised before the court, which required the court to refuse to grant consent, or which would prohibit the development of power stations per se. And uh, his honour went on to say, uh, whether they should be prohibited is, of course, a matter of government policy, and it is not for the court to impose such a prohibition. Now, there is, of course, still no prohibition in Australia against building coal-fired power stations, against expanding coal exports, or against undertaking any other activity that is seriously damaging to the global climate. I think it's fair to say that so far our legal system has proved, has proved largely impotent in achieving the societal objective of preventing dangerous climate change. And in that sense, our current system of laws and institutional arrangements is failing us. Now, the problem from the, for the law here is one that we know from other contexts, and that is that when systems of law and governance are perceived as unable to deal with uh, widely recognised social problems, that can cause a crisis of legitimacy. Many years ago, it was the gap between the fact of continuing traditional, uh, continuing indigenous traditional ownership of land and waters in Australia, and the law's abject failure to recognise those social facts that precipitated the crisis of legitimacy that was only resolved through the Mabo case. So we have one of the participants in that litigation here with us. I trust you have all seen the, the uh, 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 wonderful minutes here. Um, today, I would argue that we face a similar dynamic the overwhelming fact, the overwhelming observable and experienceable fact of environmental degradation, accompanied by the uh, failure of our system of law and governance to respond so as to guarantee our collective safety, is creating a similar crisis of legitimacy. Or to put it another way, a house that cannot provide shelter for its residents is no longer a home. Now, faced with the abject failure of the system to respond to the drivers of climate change, we must turn our minds as suffragettes, as labour activists, as champions of the anti-slavery movement, as those patriots of decolonisation, as Indigenous rights campaigners, as anti-war protesters have before us to the prospect of civil disobedience. It was as long ago as 2008 that Al Gore told an audience, if you're a young person looking at the future of this planet and look at what is being done right now and not done, I believe we have reached the stage where it is time for civil disobedience to prevent the construction of new coal plants that do not have carbon capture and sequestration. Would that that technology existed or looked likely to exist any time soon. The term civil disobedience was coined by Henry David Thoreau in the 19th century in an essay in which he explained his refusal to pay the state poll tax implemented by the American government to pay for a series of causes that he thought were unjust, including a war in Mexico and the fugitive slave law. And since then, the term has passed into common use, uh, although its, its precise ambit remains, of course, the subject of philosophical discussion. Uh, John Rawls, the late John Rawls, described civil disobedience in this way as a public, non-violent and conscientious breach of law undertaken with the aim of bringing about a change in law or government policies. So very, very significantly in Rawls' view, the persons who practice civil disobedience are willing to accept the legal consequences of their actions, thereby showing their fidelity to the rule of law per se. So civil obedience does not, in other words, does not entail disrespect for the rule of law or for its agents uh, like the judiciary and the police. Indeed, acceptance of principled and non-violent civil disobedience, I would argue, is foundational to a thriving pluralist civil democracy operating under the rule of law. And in this regard, Australia, a thriving pluralist liberal democracy, has been no exception. 
From the Nook and Bar blockade, to the Franklin River, to the protests against the Vietnam War, civil disobedience forms a precious part of Australia's democratic heritage. And Greenpeace, famously, has long been part of that Australian heritage. Now, I want to briefly go back to uh, my own transition from lawyer to campaigner. And while I knew intellectually, I guess, what Greenpeace activists would do in the line of duty, it was really quite another thing to experience the endeavour firsthand. And the first sort of illegal thing I was associated with involved getting up very early in the morning and constructing an enormous brick wall that, that literally shut off the European Council building in Brussels. Um, uh, because what was going to happen was the European fisheries ministers were going to get together and agree to catch limits that year on year, year in, year out, were well above what the scientists recommended as being sensible. And so, surprise, surprise, European fish stocks were a total disaster and the subsidised European overcapacity ends up in foreign waters, whether it's pillaging the west coast of Africa or sending super trawlers to Australia. Um, and so, uh, there, uh, there are around 200 to 250 activists who managed to construct this enormous wall very swiftly uh, under the watchful eye of um, somewhat surprised Belgian police. Uh, you can still watch it online in the, in the wonderful way of things never actually going away again. Um, goodness, I'm glad I'm not a teenager in the 21st century. Um, you can still watch footage of the wall being constructed. Um, uh, and it was, I have to say, and in the words of an English passerby, a very nice bit of brickwork. I mean, they, they, we knew what we were doing, and it was a fine wall, but it was constructed as uh, deconstructed as quickly as it was constructed, and by noon the whole thing was gone, and the 200 or so activists had all been taken into custody. But what struck me in the conversations leading up to the building of that wall, and has continued to strike me since in my time at Greenpeace, is the moral seriousness that accompanies decisions about law-breaking. This is not a matter of being engaged in japes or vandalism or anything cheap. These are morally serious actions that are undertaken entirely within the principles of civil disobedience as outlined by John Rawls. And truly, engaging in civil disobedience is not, in my experience, anything that any Greenpeace activist ever undertakes lightly. And I think in the manner of our breaching it, we show our deference to and our fidelity to the rule of law, you might say, the honour of the breach. But let's make it human. Let me talk for a moment about a bloke called Paul Morozzo, who I had the uh, honour of working with a bit in London. Now, Paul Morozzo, or perhaps as he's inevitably known, Mozza, um, is a 40-something dad, uh, and he's the sort of uh, fella who, when you meet, you, you, you know instantly, you'd be confident you could lend him your lawnmower and you'd get it back in good working order. He's just, he's just that sort of bloke, um, honest as the day is long. Um, and in 2008, Paul Morozzo was arrested along with 19 other protesters for stopping a coal train outside Drax, the wonderfully named Drax. I mean, it's straight from a sort of Hollywood blockbuster, really, about a sort of some evil going on. The wonderfully named Drax, uh, the United Kingdom's biggest coal-fired power station. After his release from arrest, uh, Paul's bail conditions prevented him from attending an event that was known as Climate Camp, which was to be held at a site uh, called Kings North in Kent, and the significance of Kings North is that there was another large power station, coal fire power station there, and it was proposed to build uh, the UK's first new coal fire power station in 30 years. As I say, Paul's bail conditions prevented him from going. But along with four others, whose bail conditions similarly so uh, barred them from attending climate camp, Paul went anyway. Uh, breaching his bail conditions out of a sense of moral obligation. Now, Paul told journalists this. I have kids, so of course this is not something I take lightly at all. But we're at a crucial junction. The threat from climate change is profoundly serious. And if that involves going to prison, 
and I really, really do not want to go, then that is what I am prepared to do. Now, as he expected, Paul Morozzo was arrested by police for breaching his bail conditions, and he subsequently spent a number of nights, I imagine very scared, in Wandsworth Prison. Paul Morozzo became, as far as I know, the first prisoner of climate conscience, the first person on earth to be jailed for civil disobedience to stop dangerous climate change. Later in the same year, six Greenpeace activists faced trial for trying to shut down the existing Kings North station, a power station, by occupying the smokestack and painting a slogan down the side of the chimney. Now, the slogan was meant to be longer than this, but an injunction prevented them from completing it, so it ended up just saying Gordon, um, which in and of itself doesn't have a lot of meaning, but of course the, the Prime Minister at the time was Gordon Brown, and the slogan was to be addressed to Gordon Brown, but instead it just ended up saying Gordon. Um, the King's North Six argued that they were legally justified because they were trying to prevent climate change causing greater damage to property around the world, far greater than the damage they caused by scaling the King's North uh, power station. Now, the court heard from a series of illustrious witnesses speaking on behalf of the uh, King's North Six, including Professor Jim Hansen from NASA, uh, one of the uh, most esteemed climate scientists on Earth, an Inuit leader from Greenland who could talk passionately about what global warming will mean for his people, his land, his culture, and as unlikely as it might sound in this country, a leading conservative politician, Zach Goldsmith, uh, who was not then in, the, uh, in Westminster, um, he was only a candidate, but was one of those candidates who came with enough of a profile that he was already a significant figure and was advising David Cameron, and who is now inside the Parliament as the, the member for Richmond. And all spoke um, on, the, on the part, uh, gave evidence on the part of, uh, of um, the accused. And the jury found that, indeed, the applicants did have a lawful excuse, and all were acquitted. Kings North was the first case anywhere in the world in which preventing property damage caused by climate change had been used as part of a lawful excuse defence in court. But it, perhaps even more significantly, the real campaign purpose of the tactic was to prevent the building of a new coal fire power station at Kings North, and it was wholly effective because the plans have been mothballed. The age of coal fire power station in the UK is over. Civil disobedience, along with other tactics, worked. Change is possible. You can do something about climate change. A story that, at least in a limited sense, has a very positive conclusion. The case, of course, was a cause celebre and became the subject of a documentary by acclaimed filmmaker Nick Broomfield. Uh, and I think the whole film, which is freely available on the Guardian's uh, newspaper website, The Guardian, which is, of course, now coming to Australia, The Guardian Australia will be opening some time between, Australia, between April and uh, June, which is great news for media diversity in this country. But the whole 20-minute film is, I think, really worth watching, and I'd urge you to spend 20 minutes of your life on it. But given the constraints of time this evening, I'm hoping we can manage to just watch the trailer. Can we maybe dim the lights so we can do that? Campaigners have broken into a tent power station and are threatening to shut it down. Well, it's kind of like doing the Belgian campaign. Yes, it is, yes. Who can bother chilling? I'm standing right now on top of a chilling that belches out 20,000 tons of CO2 every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As we got closer to the top of the chimney, the dust got so much worse and it's the heart of the how big is that chimney? 220 metres. Was this the first illegal thing you've done? 
So it gives you a, well, it's good to play this another rather more risque thing suggested by YouTube. Um, <laughs> although I understand that there was uh, talk of a feature film um, that in the end one of the reasons it didn't go anywhere is because there was a certain reluctance um, to include uh, a love story that did not actually occur in real life and that may or may not have involved something going on at the top of the smokestack. That at least was the story I heard around the office. Um, it is significant that, that, that Broomfield called his film A Time Comes. That, that the trailer really it gives a flavour, but I would urge you to watch the, the 20 minutes of it to, to see the, the mortality, to see the, the, the moral seriousness with which I think the King's North Six undertook their actions. The, 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 the quote, A Time Comes, in context, uh, is drawn from a statement by Martin Luther King in New York in 1967. And King says this, A time comes when silence is betrayal. Men do not easily assume the task of opposing their government's policy, especially in time of war. We must speak with all the humility that is appropriate to our limited vision, but we must speak. For we are deeply in need of a new way beyond the darkness so close around us. And I think it is timely, really, to, to reflect on Martin Luther King's words in the context of contemporary Australia. Time comes when silence is betrayal. Men do not easily assume the task, to put to one side the, the sexism of the language, men and women do not easily assume the task of opposing their government's policy. We may not be in a time of war, but we are in a time when the status quo is very heavy in this country. We must speak with humility, but we must speak. And in Australia in 2013, silence does indeed envelop us. And I want to go uh, back now, just for a moment, to the climate science, to concentrate specifically on what's, um, what's predicted for Australia. Um, and in short, the implications for our country are particularly bleak. This is the headline in a recent piece in Grist, the highly regarded uh, US environmental blog. Um, I couldn't work out how to do the screen grab, so what you have is, is um, some of the article typed out. But the headline, as you read, is Australia is so, so screwed. And it was a review of a longer piece that appeared in Rolling Stone magazine, uh, which talked about the end of Australia. Just last week, the Climate Commission produced this rather wonderful infographic of what they called Our Angry Summer, which just set out the sheer number of records that were broken in this summer that was made worse by climate change and was a sign of what is to come. Already our country is suffering from climate change. And absent a, a change in policy direction around the world, things are going to get much, much worse. So we have a massive national self-interest in helping ourselves on this. And our single biggest contribution to this fate that we are already experiencing and this worse fate that awaits us is our coal exports. Australia's coal industry and emissions that come from the coal burned from the coal that is exported now are already greater than domestic emissions. But what is planned is a more... Is a, so I'm going to have a glass of water here. I'm doing my best to juggle the water and the paper and not to cause something that doesn't uh, show it rather well. 
Australia's coal industry is planning to more than double its coal exports in little over a decade. Now this move would add an extra 900 million tonnes of carbon dioxide per year to the atmosphere. In total, if Australian coal exports increase by the volume estimated by the Australian Bureau of Resource and Energy Economics, Australian export coal would be, could be responsible in 2025 for 1,200 million tonnes of carbon dioxide pollution annually. And it's always worth remembering one of the ways in which uh, the, the Queensland Resources Council and, and others dismiss the work of Greenpeace is by attacking our figures. Our figures are only ever drawn from what industry and government has said publicly. So uh, I'm always waiting for that letter that clarifies which part of their own glossy brochures they're, they're not believing. Now, those figures from the coal industry compare with our own domestic greenhouse emissions from all of our power stations, cars, cattle and industry of under 600 million tonnes. In January, Greenpeace internationally released a report that looked at 14 of the largest remaining repositories of, of carbon emissions that, that if released, will we'll spell game over, really. Um, and of these, the second largest globally was the taken as a whole, the expansion of Australian coal exports. Dwarfed by the planned expansion of, of coal exports in China, but nevertheless the second most significant in the world. And taking together these unconventional, these irresponsible, these out of control fossil fuel enterprises, taken together, uh, they lock us into a global path towards four degrees and worse and worse and worse. But the striking thing, if the sort of appalling this weren't enough, the striking thing is despite the radical, the proposed radical expansion of Australia's coal industry and the consequences for us as a nation if this occurs, is that no government in Australia even keeps track of the figures of what will happen if we export this coal, of the emissions that will result if our coal is burnt in, in uh, power stations in, in Southeast Asia, let alone considering actually stepping in to do something. Further expansion of coal exports is encouraged virtually without question by both major political parties. Yet they know the problem. I've already sat across enough desks from clever parliamentarians who know the problem and whose eyes give away the pain that they feel in knowing the problem because they've got families too. They've got young children in their families too that are going to have to face a globally warmed world. They know the problem, but they dare not speak its name. A menacing hush grips our politics on this issue. So let's ask the question, what price the silence. Would we, for example, be prepared to sacrifice the Great Barrier Reef, one of these seven natural wonders of the world? Well, maybe we would. In 2012, the UN body responsible for world heritage areas, UNESCO, sent a delegation to Australia to investigate threats to the Great Barrier Reef, and their report was scathing, noting that unprecedented scales of development in the world heritage area, in the world heritage area itself, in our liberal, rich democracy, in the World Heritage Area itself, quote, poses serious concerns over its long-term conservation. <coughs> as an Australian, and I am, a, I am a proud Australian, as an Australian, I am shocked and appalled that there is a significant chance that the Great Barrier Reef will join the likes of the Bamiyan Buddhas, dynamited by the <coughs> Taliban, uh, on the UNESCO World Heritage in Bangladesh. Up to nine new coal terminals are planned for the Great Barrier Reef Coast, along with the dredging of the seafloor, the increased shipping traffic and other impacts. And at, and at what cost? To what end? In order to dig up and burn coal that will itself send carbon emissions, so, carbon emissions soaring and that will then deliver the final coup de grace to the reef through um, ocean acidification, which is one of the consequences of global warming. Now that's even before we start talking about the destruction of local communities 
and the cost of countless real and existing jobs in tourism and agriculture, which is the inevitable consequence of a further expansion of coal mining. Our governments seem determined to turn the Great Barrier Reef into an industrial zone. Environmental lawyer Chris McGrath from the University of Queensland has bravely spoken truth to power on this issue and said this on record, no one likes to say it out loud, but we should publicly recognise that we are planning to destroy the Great Barrier Reef. We face the loss of one of the seven wonders of the natural world, a wonder that is in our care and custody to protect. And still the silence grips us, broken only by the whisperings in our hearts that something is just not right. So as lawyers, as law students, as citizens, as activists, we need to take a deep breath and we need to speak about this uncomfortable business. We must end the silence. And earlier this year, as our country was gripped by extreme heat and fires, there was a beginning, one effort among many, made to break that silence. I co-signed a letter uh, that was published in the Australian Financial Review that was signed by, among others, some eminent climate scientists, including Professor David Caroli, by the former government of Victoria Professor David de Kretzer, by the former Premier of Western Australia, Dr Carmen Lawrence, by Professor Robert Mann from La Trobe, uh, by Ian Lowe uh, and others. And our letter called on, and I'll quote from it now, called on Australia to cease the expansion of coal exports from this country and join efforts to prevent global warming running out of control and destroying lives and livelihoods here and abroad. Our coal has contributed to global greenhouse gas emissions which have worsened extreme weather. People at home and abroad are suffering as a result. We went on, our choice is clear. Cease expansion of coal exports or willfully threaten the future of our children. We understand, we said in the letter, that it is not easy for Australians to talk about the role of, that our coal plays in driving climate change but we can no longer maintain our silence. <coughs> it is the case. A time comes. So what does the time mean for law students, for lawyers, for legal academics, for those who understand how the system of power and governance works in this country? Will there be rainbows in the courtroom? <coughs> or is that just it then? Are we to be the generation that lost the Great Barrier Reef? Will we surrender our greatest natural wonder to the coal industry? Will we give up on the run chase of hauling in uh, the rising carbon emissions, keeping the global rise to under two degrees? And we know the answer to this. We know the answer to this. It is simply unthinkable. We will not lose the reef. We cannot lose the reef. And we will not surrender to out-of-control climate change as some kind of grim inevitability. We will remember our agency in this. And the terrific thing about talking to a room full of lawyers is that lawyers always think about what it is that can be done. You can almost hear the wheels starting to turn. You know, it's that old business, a sort of a lawyer turns up at the, at the moment where they, you're going to get sent down below or you're going to go up and meet St Peter's and say, well, you know, what are my options here? Um, I need, I'll get some advice. What are the cases say? Is there a cause of action? The great thing about lawyers is they think about that agency, that ability to challenge a state of affairs. So I know you'll already be thinking, those of you in the room who are lawyers and law students, what do we do about this? And as citizens, as lawyers, as law students, I would urge you, we need your support. As lawyers, you can take the work and you can bring the cases. And for those of you here who are already engaged in this work, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But can we have more of the same, please? And for those of you in doubt, please, we need your help. We need your advice. 
we need your representation, we need your support as citizens, we need you fighting for law reform, we need you agitating doctrine, we need you searching the common law for useful concepts, we need you talking to your international colleagues for ideas that might work in Australia, and we need you agitating the idea that a legal system that permits this to occur is necessarily experiencing a crisis of its own legitimacy. For only when lawyers say this will the word start to take hold. We need you taking test cases. We need your very generous offers of pro bono assistance. We need you providing the legal support to campaigners and to activists who are putting their bodies and their reputations on the line. For every King's North Six, we know there is a legal team, just as there was a legal team behind the Mabo case many years ago, that secured that historic and unlikely win. We need defenders of civil disobedience, defenders who share Greenpeace's fidelity to the rule of law and our acceptance of the science that we face a national and planetary emergency and will speak out. At the risk of sounding like an old-fashioned patriot, my friends, your country needs you. The movement needs you, the climate needs you, the Great Barrier Reef needs you, and the times call for effort from all of us. And I am confident that you will answer the call of the times. Thank you for coming along tonight. Thank you, David. We do have opportunity to take a few questions. If anyone's uh, got a question, we'd like to be able to use the microphone. Uh, use the microphone so that we can uh, hear you properly. Um, Janice, there's a lady. Uh, my name is Annette Brennan. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm an anti Greenpeace supporter. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what I'm concerned with, with with Queensland, and I've been looking at um, some of the campaigns that Get Up's been trying to get going and things like that as well, is that a lot of coal mine ownership isn't necessarily Australian. If it is, is it our friend Clive Palmer? And who is actually funding all of these courts? If it's coming from overseas, how much labour have we got for doing something? <laughs> um, look, first of all, thank you for your support. And um, nothing that Greenpeace does is possible without the support. And so whenever anyone says, I support you, um, the, the thanks is heartfelt and genuine. Thank you. Um, you raise a, a terrific question, really. We often see a certain false patriotism on behalf of sections of the mining industry. Now, I am not against mining. Um, I like modernity. I, I believe in the Enlightenment. And I like our complex, advanced society. But we need to take a bit of a critical eye to the mining industry and to draw some distinctions within it. And it is true that the uh, majority, as I understand it, I think that the figure published by, I'd need to check, check the source, but I think the figure published by Rio Tinto was that as high as 83% of the profits of the mining industry end up overseas. And it is true that when you look at the uh, integration of, of companies, the complex of companies that is exporting the Galilee Basin in particular, you do see... Uh, international interests, India and China and so on, deeply involved. I think, though, we do need to be very careful because um, there is nothing wrong with internationalism per se, of course. Um, and to the extent that it raises questions around how we deal with these issues internationally, well, we do have a global framework of, of, of law and diplomacy but also in a campaigns context, we have campaigners and activists and citizens and lawyers who are fighting the same fight that we are fighting in Australia, in India, in China. Now we're very fortunate next week, um, sorry, that's now this week, uh, we're very fortunate this week to be joined in Australia for the first time by the new Rainbow Warrior. And please 
do come down and see the, the new warrior. We'd love to see you uh, down there. Um, James, when will the first open day be? Saturday. Saturday, the uh, open day of the Rainbow Warrior. Please do come on down. Um, it, is, it is an iconic and a, and a historic boat. Uh, uh, come down and, and say hello. Um, we're lucky enough to be joined by, uh, for that tour, an Indian uh, campaigner who has really come to Australia to speak about the unsuitability of coal as a fuel for ending poverty in India, in India, and to speak about the rise of the Indian renewables industry. And this, I think, is a crucial story to tell in Australia. Coal doesn't end fuel poverty in India, and the renewables industry is on the march, and we must support that renewables industry in India. Hello, David. Brendan Sykes from the Environment Defenders Office here in Victoria. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I think we're very fortunate to have someone with such a deep and broad understanding of all any other major conservation organisation here in Australia. Uh, the, the, the arguments you put forward are about, about, about the problem and about the need for civil disobedience. I think are really convincing, but, but then what? I mean, you talked about, I think you quoted Chris McGrath in terms of the system of regulation at the moment through the planning for the destruction of the Great Barrier Reef. But what's the alternative? What's your vision for a new legal system? Always that sort of scenario developing. Um, well, I'm no longer a lawyer, but I mean, the answer to these things is that one needs a a proper system of regulation that says that that is premised on the notion that the fundamental purpose of law is to guarantee the ongoing safe continuity of the community that abides by those laws. And at the moment, we have a system of law in Australia that in the context of climate change is, is failing to do that. And I think the economic concomitant to that is that just as we had a restructuring of the economy in the 1980s to address what were then understood to be structural problems with the way we were doing business. So we need to undergo an industrial restructure that says, well, the 19th century technology of, of, of expanding coal exports is simply not a sound basis upon which to anchor Australia's economy going forward. So we have, in other words, done this kind of thing before. We've shifted our legal system as we've needed to, to in order to guarantee our ongoing prosperity as a country, and at the same, and we shifted our economy with it. So we're very good at this sort of thing in Australia. We actually should be incredibly optimistic about this, and not least because one of our uh, natural advantages is, of course, that, that there is nowhere better placed on Earth to be a solar superpower. We have this stuff coming out of the sky all the time. Goodness knows there was enough of it around in Melbourne today. So there are real reasons why, as a country, we should be embracing this opportunity uh, rather than thinking that it's something to be afraid of. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, David Yarrow. I have a two-part question. Um, firstly, following up on what you just said about uh, ideas for solutions, uh, I know you've got a lot of experience European environmental policy, what can you tell us about uh, extended product liability as a uh, possible inspiration for closing the loop of responsibility for the needed impacts of climate change? And the second part of my question, maybe a bit more frivolous, um, my favourite book about uh, forestry policy is called Talk and Log. Um, what do you think about Australian political economy, the way good things do happen in the environment, but there's a moral blind spot. To what extent are politicians or our political culture engaged in confession and avoidance? Yes, we do support global warming, we encourage it, and yet look at something good over here. Um, I wouldn't want to uh, claim to be an expert in European environmental policy. I mean, what what the way I would approach the question about extended product liability is really through a, a campaign rubric. Um, and in a sense, I would answer it by saying that wherever you are contributing to a major environmental wrong, whether that be direct or indirect, you have, as a business, a, a latent problem. Um, and in the context of a room full of, of 
not everybody is a, is a lawyer, but in the context of a room of many lawyers, I was fascinated to see in the recent Guy Pearce book, Greenwash, that there was actually a chapter devoted to greenwashing law firms. Now, I'm not aware of any previous instance where law firms have been identified as potential targets for environmental campaigners because of the work they were undertaking. But I think Guy Pearce has really opened the door there. I mean, we already we have seen work undertaken against management consultancies. McKinsey was a was a target of Greenpeace's uh, last year and the year before. Uh, uh, public relations companies have certainly found themselves from time to time. But I think this is probably a, a, a I think Guy Pearce has, has pointed to something interesting there um, in his book of Greenwash. As for the the curious nature of Australian politics as it is now, again, if we if we think about what happened in the 1980s, and regardless of how one regards the, the raft of economic reforms that accompanied what I guess you know, generally is referred to as the Washington Consensus, or economic rationalism in Australia, regardless of how one regards that normatively, there was a policy consensus and there was a policy bravery there. There was a preparedness to engage in leadership and there was bipartisan support for what was done. And so if you read, you know, Michael Pusey's classic account of that, what you see is a, is a vanguard of policymakers who see a problem and are prepared to, to lead and to fix it and to do some difficult things. And you can actually imagine an alternative reality in Australia where you have a set of uh, parliamentarians in Canberra who identify that we face the climate equivalent of the banana republic where if we do not act, we are in serious trouble. And where they say leadership is required, and where in a bipartisan way, there is a consensus on industrial restructuring so that people can, the trans, so that we can transition out of the coal trade in a fair, humane, just, orderly way. And we can take advantage of the, the solar superpower future and the renewable future that beckons where we properly fund our universities rather than sort of, you know, sitting where we do in the OECD table, where we have a set of parliamentarians who are, in a sense, far more confident in the abilities and the future of Australian people. I mean, this is an extraordinary thing. It is such an intensely negative, pessimistic view of Australian potential to say that all we can do is dig up a mineral that is going to bring our undoing. It's remarkable. And so, yes, I think there is something rather strange going on in the, the Australian political cycle. Thanks. Um, Thanks. 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 I work as a Look, I completely agree with you that we need to transition our economy from um, coal to fuels for the, the um, shorter but for the longer term. Um, but Australia does have a carbon price in place, and that is it's not ideal, but it's a very important first step. Um, and I'm astounded at the moment in the political climate that there is no uh, political leadership on climate change, and there's no community. Um, sort of sounding the storm of support really for the retention of carbon price when we're at a time the coalition might take away that carbon price. And I just wonder what Greenpeace is doing, if anything, to sort of garner support for um, retaining the carbon price as we approach the election. Look, the carbon price is a, is a good start, and there are other good things that have happened, but in a sense, that, that only emphasises the policy schizophrenia that, scripts, that grips the place, that on the one hand, you have the carbon price, you have the coalition's direct action plan, you have uh, the renewable energy target and other mechanisms. But on the other hand, you have the expansion of the coal industry as fast as we can possibly dig the stuff up, it seems. Um, I think underneath the controversy around the uh, carbon pricing mechanism, What's significant is that you actually have consensus on Kyoto. You have consensus on two degrees. And what that means is that there should actually be some possibility going forward to transcend 
the, the partisan politics and to find a new kind of consensus around this. I mean, it, we, are, we are not too far away from 2009 when briefly it looked like we were going to have a policy consensus on this. And one of the first things I did when I came into the job is, um, naively perhaps, but, but in good faith, simply urge uh, the political leadership in this country to seek to forge a new <coughs> consensus on this. I mean, people who enter political life, I, I genuinely believe, do so with the best of intentions. And I think they have their better selves that remain there regardless of what the, the, the day-to-day demands of the, the press cycle and so on throw at them. And I think there is a role to speak to the better selves of our parliamentary representatives and to urge them to find a new consensus and to urge them to take seriously what the science says and to urge them to look beyond the carbon pricing mechanism to say what comes next. Oh, I'll just yell. Just yell. Um, I'm a law student, and when we're talking about civil disobedience, I want to become admitted as a lawyer, and I just wonder if you can talk a bit about what the implications are if you take that to an unfortunate uh, Yes, well, look, as a former lawyer, I mean, I don't have a practising certificate anymore. I decided I no longer wanted to be a lawyer, so I, I allowed it to lapse. It seemed a, a vanity, in a sense, just to keep a practising certificate when I wasn't intending to practise again. Um, so... But the short answer is I don't actually know what the implications are um, for a law student or, in fact, for a lawyer. Um, but I think that would be an excellent topic to agitate. Actually, I need the question from another student at the Environment Defenders um, event recently, which was talking about civic experience. And there was, there was a big question. It was really, really interesting. I mean, I would encourage anyone who is contemplating civil disobedience to be fully apprised of what the legal consequences are, because these are decisions that need to be taken seriously, morally seriously, in terms of personal consequences, consequences for families and, and so on. Um, and that, again, is what shows the, the respect and fidelity for the, for the rule of law, that one takes the consequences seriously. I would never urge someone just to do something on a, on a rush of blood, but always to think very seriously about it but I would encourage you to think very seriously about it. I think we'll take the last question up there. Last one? Yeah. Um, I'm a third year, I'm a law student. Um, I guess I'm not really wanting to practice like law, but I'm certainly really passionate. Um, and I was wondering what your thoughts were on how that visible, that actual degree can be and how you found that in terms of environmental uh, uh, campaigning, which is where I want to be seeing myself, yeah. Yeah, about that kind of like relationship between the two. Uh, we, can have a, we can have a chat afterwards, but um, look, I think law is one way of looking at the distribution of power, and it gives you a range of useful skills for that. But the thing about campaigning is that it actually takes the whole sort of uh, universe of, of how power is distributed. You know, power is distributed by cultural mechanisms, by economic mechanisms, by personal mechanisms. And so when you work as a campaigner, you need to be across what the legal options are and the way that the law allocates power, but you also need to think in the wider universe. And so a law degree is, is one useful qualification you can have as a campaigner, but there are uh, many others. Um, one of the finest uh, campaigners I know is someone whose background is in English literature. Um, so I think actually you can make a great campaigner out of any number of disciplinary backgrounds. Law is certainly one of them, and, and good on you for having the ambition to make the difference. That was actually the second last question. <laughs> the last one's over here. Sorry about that last Thank you. Um, James and I, this is my name, I'm barrister here at the Victorian Bar, and I see some other barristers here tonight. Um, over the last couple of years, I became more and more involved in a fight for forests, and you've used the Great Barrier Reef as a great example of carbon mining, uh, sorry, coal mining. But here in Victoria, we would consider our cool temperate forests as an equivalent um, um, iconic a piece of Australia which is being destroyed by clear felling and um, 
even in terms of the carbon equation, it's a great sequestrate of carbon to retain the native forests that are currently being clear felled. And I just wanted to bring that front of mind to you for your comments and what Greenpeace might be doing um, to try and win this uh, moral war against clear felling and protecting biodiversity. Look, thanks for the question and, and thanks for the work you've done on forests. And I want to thank my colleague at the Environmental Defenders Office, which I neglected to earlier on after you identified. I mean, thank you for the for the work for the work that you do. Um, one of the difficult things about working at any environmental or probably any NGO is that you just can't do all the worthy things that you wish you could do. And Greenpeace isn't involved in the in the Victorian forestry issue, but I am I am aware of uh, the problem and have spoken to a number of people in Victoria about it. Um, I'm, again, I'm happy to have a, a dialogue for what, what might be done. This is, in a sense, the tragedy that confronts us, is that it is not... It were that it was only climate change. <laughs> but even if we get across the line on climate change... There is deforestation, which of course is a contributor to climate change, but on its own terms, because of the biodiversity loss, because of the loss of these wonderful places, um, there is the, the, the crisis of, of overfishing. Um, there is the crisis of the litter that's clogging up our waterways and the litigation brought by multinationals like Coca-Cola to prevent container deposit schemes. There is so much important work to be done. So, look, I commend the, the work you're doing and let's have a chat. Thank you very much. Even I can't get the microphone to work. Thank you, David. Thanks, Melissa. Um, and uh, just before we wrap up, I'd just like to mention thanks very much to Janice and Andre and the technical crew who have helped us tonight. David, you've presented us with a very sobering uh, but powerful insight to the uh, campaign side and the civil, civil disobedience impacts. Uh, and particularly how that might reflect for lawyers and some of the law students here. The, you law students come and talk to me after I'll tell you the answer to that. Um, but if, uh, David's around for a little while longer to um, answer individual questions, and I uh, do recommend that anyone who's interested go down and have a look at the Rainbow Warrior. If you're kind of our age, it has great historical significance. If you're a bit younger, it has a different significance. Where is it for me? Uh, Port Melbourne. Uh, yeah. Prince's Pier. Prince's Pier. Prince's Pier at Port Melbourne. It's the 109 tram. End of the 109. End of the 109 tram. Any other bids? So if you'll join me in thanking David Ritter for his terrific <laughs>